You're live. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the end of the month meeting of Mahone Bay Town Council. Beautiful May evening. Uh, like to welcome all of council to this meeting, as well as we have uh, two uh, citizens who have joined us in council chambers. And we have folks watching us on YouTube uh, from home that allows them to participate in the council meeting as well. And I understand there's a couple of people out in Colwood, BC that are watching tonight's uh, session. Do you have an agenda? But before we do that, we will begin the meeting as we have in, we're in the habit of doing, of acknowledging that we are gathered tonight in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral present and future territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Tonight, we gather with the intent, followed by the Living Peace and Friendship Treaties, we do know respect, cooperation, and coexistence. For those of you that are watching us uh, from the fire, tonight when the agenda is completed, uh, before we go into uh, a closed session, those of you who are watching from home will have the opportunity, or here in the county chamber, will have the opportunity to ask questions of council on any issue that was discussed in tonight's meeting. Okay, Council, do you have an agenda? What is your wish? Do we have a seconder? Councillor Carver? I'll second it, but I also want to add something to the agenda. Okay. Under new business, which is just a notice of motion. Notice of motion for the next council meeting? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, Move and seconded that we approve the agenda as amended. All in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. Let's go to the minutes of the regular council meeting of May the 9th. Councilor Feeney? Uh, Mayor, they look in good order. I move that we accept them as presented. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Wilson. On the motion. All in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. And now the special council meeting of May the 11th. The council accept them as presented. Thank you. Councilor Lonis Croft seconds it. Uh, on the motion, on the question, all in favor, motion is carried. We do not have any presentations uh, tonight. Um, where's the public? Oh, the public input session. Thank you, Councilor. Now, number three, that's a recent. Uh, amendment to our standard agenda. We had conducted or encouraged public input for 15 minutes before the council meeting began, but if there was a decision by council to include it in the agenda. So we would now have an opportunity for any public input. Anyone wants to uh, make a statement or de declare an issue, uh, then they're free to do that now. And you can also, if anybody, has anybody made an arrangement to make a statement from externally? We don't ask that people let us know ahead of time. Okay. Um, so I haven't mean? heard anything externally, no. Okay. <laughs> anything? Yes, again, so many things. <laughs> Um, but the main reason that um, uh, myself, Danielle, for those of you were playing the home game, and uh, Betty from uh, Betty's Wine Bar and Restaurant, and um, the Chamber of Commerce, and the Chamber of Commerce, um, so we'd um, just like to quickly address what was put forth in the April 27th uh, Council meeting regarding the uh, proposed noise bylaw. Um, from how it reads on this end, um, I think. For one, I would strongly suggest that you have uh, a lawyer review it. That's, there, are, there are some uh, phrases and terminology in there that I think is very misleading. Um, you might get yourself into trouble. So 
just FYI, you're leaving uh, some doors open. Uh, we'd like to speak to who this affects. Um, from just what just we can one tell. One second, please, Deputy Mayor. Do you mind going back a little bit and sort of clarifying what you're referring to? Right. I'm referring to um, page 60 through 67 uh, of the April 27th council meeting with the proposed bylaw uh, for noise. Thank you. Um, so which I have here if anybody wants to, you know, wants a quick overview of it. Um, like I said, some of the verbiage is, is fairly interesting and it probably needs a little more expansion. Um, our take on this basically is just, it's another piece that's seemingly being added to a puzzle um, along with the bylaw surrounding parking and the bylaw surrounding, um, you know, Airbnbs and whatnot in town, that it, it really appears to us that the council is not necessarily supportive of the business community. Um, with the three of those things combined, you are basically going to destroy a town that thrives on the tourism industry and every single business that's in this town, which contributes to almost 40% of your tax base. Um, watch your property values fall. Anybody that owns a home or a business in this town should be very concerned right now. Um, last uh, time we were here, um, last week, we spoke a little bit about the parking issues um, and certainly some of the parking issues that I personally had um, at my property at 319 Main. And uh, we also, I think, spoke rather quickly about um, what you're planning to do as far as the Airbnb thing goes, or sorry, the Airbnb thing goes. Um, today is to address the uh, proposed noise bylaw. Um, this affects numerous businesses in town. Um, it certainly affects our working waterfront and uh, Mike Kelly. It certainly affects Steve Barry and his yard over on Y Street. Um, we joked about it earlier and said, it's also pretty much the day that the music died. Um, it affects almost every single restaurant or pub in town. Um, it affects Rebecca's, Mateus, the Saltbox, Betty's, the Muddy Anchor, uh, the Nosy Crow. Um, all of us support the local arts community and specifically um, local musicians uh, by having them play at our venues, um, both, both acoustically and amplified. Um, that's a bit of an issue. Uh, you'll, you're also going to affect the Mahone Bay Music Association, um, of which I'm on the board, and we do a, you know, the summer concert series at the gazebo. Um, that's a bit of a problem. Um, and it goes so far, as because of the way it's worded, it even goes so far to speak to anybody that wants to have, you know, a birthday party in their, in their backyard or sit around a campfire in the evening and strum a guitar or have a radio playing in the background. It reads that if your neighbor doesn't like the type of music you were playing or if they deem it to be too loud, then it's a problem. Um, I mean, I'm sure you can probably speak to this because you live next to the salt box. They're good neighbors. They, um, they, they, they are good neighbors. I'm sure they are. But yes. I mean, they also they play amplified music um, during the day and in the evening, as do we. Um, they don't tend to go past 9 o'clock, um, much like us. Um, it's not really going to affect us personally, um, because again, I have guests living in essentially a hotel room and, you know, at nine or thereabouts, I need to shut it down anyway, because people are paying good money to come and sue. Um, but this is going to affect every business in town and it's going to affect every resident. You know, if I don't like what my neighbor is doing, I don't like the fact that, you know, um, you can even have a blast in your deep purple at 9.30 at night, as they tend to do, then I get the right to complain about it, and I'm right. It's The bylaw is not what you propose. The bylaw is not even written so that there's a discussion of it. It's whoever whoever makes the complaint <laughs> um, is automatically deemed as correct. So <laughs> that's going to get you into some, some legal trouble, I think. So that's kind of our, our opinion on that. Um, and I guess, you know, furthermore to it, you're proposing a bylaw that's really difficult to enforce, and you're also proposing a bylaw based on one person and one person that spends their entire life at the salt box listening to live music. But that's okay because it's not in their backyard. All right. Thank you. Uh, we do have some 
A few minutes left, yeah. Because I think we changed that, that we can ask questions. Um, the chamber met last night together. You said you were representing the chamber. What were what were some of the comments? One of our discussions last evening was about the parking, and there was a proposal being written by Annette St. Ange and myself regarding the parking. We're doing our due diligence with all the surrounding towns, what their current parking restrictions are um, or, lack of. or lack of. Lunenburg has absolutely none. Um, the gentleman, Arthur McDonald, I believe is his name. I spoke with him and he said it foolishness actually is the word he used. Um, that was our main focus last evening. Today, this one came up and I'll bring this to the, to the chamber as well. But this would be very concerning to everybody in the chamber. Mm. If we can't have music and entertainment, that's a sad day. So on the chamber's family. homepage, if you go to mahomebay.com, right on the front page, it's come and visit Mahone Bay. You know, sit and have drinks on a patio and listen to local musicians. And like, we're, we're a tourist town. And that's what we've been promoting here. It's right on the chamber's front page. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think uh, maybe that's not the intent of the wording, but that's the way it reads to us in our interpretation of that. Mm -hmm. So right now, the, the number one concern is the parking of that side of the road and the right side of the road, and that makes absolutely no sense to anyone on the chamber. Very concerning. Mm -hmm. Okay, Suzanne, uh, Councillor Bronson, 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 it takes effect like at nine o'clock at night, more so than through the day. But you're saying it's going to, the way it is written, mm -hmm. it looks like you it can't can have. Time. It could be any time if you're within 200 feet of someone, you're annoyed by some sound that they make, you can complain and you will arbitrarily be found guilty. Mm -hmm. uh, and like wedding, wedding that the cathedral. Any, or or any, sure, any, any sound, sound basically the way it reads, is any sound outside that you don't like that's within 200 feet of you, you can complain. What about the boats in the harbor in the summer? I mean, I live up on the hill and I can hear a conversation on any one of those boats at any given time up until two, three in the morning or or the mug and anchor, they don't have music outside, but they open their door. And you can hear it because it carries over the water. I, it's, I think it needs to be uh, a lot more clarity to what is, is and, and you cannot. I don't see how you can possibly find someone guilty of an offense with, with, without evidence. And, and our neighbor, quite frankly, uh, has a barking dog. Uh, we've had we've had at our place so far uh, liquor and gaming commission five times been called and sat in the front lawn up until eleven o'clock at night and came over and said all I ever heard was voices. So we we were never found guilty of making a sound, but yet the way it's written now, if our neighbor doesn't read <laughs> us, which he doesn't, then. <laughs> How many fines will we have to pay? Deputy Mayor has a question. It, it just uh, uh, to point out that we will be discussing the noise bylaw at the next policy and strategy meeting. That's a good place to raise all these things. I think there's some things that you've raised that we will consider as we're having these conversations. There's some things that you've said that I disagree with personally. The bylaw doesn't say that. So I think that's the best venue for us to have that conversation and figure out, does it actually say what? The bylaw says unreasonable, but there's no definition of what unreasonable is. But it's, it also specifies which time the bylaw applies to restrictions. So, but I don't want us to go into that. We have a, we set up a, a time for us to have that conversation. We appreciate the, the feedback. I think it's very helpful. There's some things that you mentioned here that I think are very informative to us in terms of, it's a town and, and residents will be impacted by that. So if you don't see that, it's our role to clarify it so that it's very, very clear in the language that this is what we're trying to, to minimize. So we, I truly appreciate it. And I think that venue would be great. And, and the policy and strategy meeting is Monday, Monday right? next. Yeah. Next Monday. If, if, if you could provide us with a copy of what your mm -hmm. statements are, are concerning, 
then we can share that and make it part of our discussion on Monday night at the policy and strategy committee. And then 29th? This Monday. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the Facebook page, I think it would be helpful because it's the document is very large and most residents are not going to take the time to read the whole thing. I mean, we are yeah. because we have so many skin and things. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it would be helpful to post something to the community and get more community input besides from other people other than being one myself. And if the policy committee ultimately recommended to council a, a noise bylaw, a policy on it, then there would be public consultation as a result of that as well, where it, it would be advertised and an opportunity would be available for people to come in and comment on the proposed bylaw at that point. And it's my understanding and that it's maybe conjecture. I understand one of our as you know done away with that it was not something that they could deal with. I, I and I don't know that to be true. But, but that's my understanding. I don't know. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Nothing would suffice. <laughs> <laughs> and then just to finalize, I think it's very, very helpful if you write to us when 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 you summarize those which particular segments of the bylaw are you concerned about? Because that's way that will become clear to us what areas we need to address, uh, as opposed to the whole. If you say the whole thing, then we're, we're trying to pick out what exactly is at that level. So that would be very helpful if you can do that. Small basin here a very long time with no noise bylaw. Mm -hmm. Why now? Oh, they've had the movie years. Have they disappeared? Um, they must still be on the book somewhere. I mean, to be fair, I mean, the Pieces it's been requested. I mean, our, the, we've we've been canvassed extensively by mm -hmm. a large base of, of our citizens, and they've asked us to explore it and evaluate it and try to come up with a draft. And I think, to your point, um, like we, do, we, we don't have a, tr a perfect draft. Uh, we're at the very beginning. Uh, phase of the evaluation, and there's going to be lots of checks and balances, and there'll be many opportunities for the public to weigh in and, and to improve the document. So, I mean, the reason why we're talking about it is because the citizens have asked us to talk, have asked us to implement it, and at least evaluate it. I mean, a dozen. I mean, we've had many. We had a letter. Uh, we've had a. I would say at least half a dozen letters in the last in the last year. I've had uh, short we, 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 we have two or three letters on tonight's tonight's agenda in favor of the and right. Okay. And I think they used to control it sometimes with curfews. So when the noise was coming from youth hanging around the bridges and stuff, they when I was young, <laughs> they would have they would have like a nine o'clock curfew. You might remember those or that the kids had to be off the streets when they were well, because they were having lots of vandalism and whatnot. So it's a That's way of back in the old days. In the old days. Uh, the old days. Actually, we're down to the Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was never sure. allowed to hang out on the bridge. Okay. <laughs> okay. Our, uh, our 15 minutes has been allocated for that portion of the agenda are concluded. Uh, so we'll move on. Uh, there are no presentations. Item five is correspondence. Now, we would normally have our correspondence identified as either for information or for action, but as a result of a policy and strategy decision, it is now one boiling pot of <laughs> written correspondence. Now we got to all of them. <laughs> okay. What is your wish, Councillor Carver? Um, <clears throat> your Worship, I can't remember what we decided in terms of uh, staff reply to each individual letter, but I want to uh, single out item 5.4, the letter from Paul Seltzer about the logo, and I think it definitely warrants a reply, uh, particularly <laughs> Uh, to in response, to, in, Go ahead, in response to his um, 
very strong uh, plea, impassioned plea to return to the original um, logo that came from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and specifically, I'm thinking that um, it, it would be important to let him know that technically it was uh, recognized that that particular logo just doesn't work anymore in terms of um, the kind of usage it has we need now in terms of, um, well, technical re reproduction and so on. At any rate, I think okay. that letter deserves a reply. Councillor Olmos Um, And that was discussed many, many times around mm -hmm. the table. And that is what I would say 80% of the, the committee would like to do. Um, we've um, tried it, we're trying a different process on that because of some of the feedback. But I would like a copy of this letter to be sent to all the members of the uh, of the well, committee, if well, possible. I was going to suggest that, that our action could be to refer the letter to the committee and advise Mr. Seltzer that that's what has happened, mm -hmm. and that the committee will be making a recommendation to council at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. And I. I think the referral to committee requires the motion, but writing back to tell him that wouldn't because now the policy said <laughs> people will be informed of the receipt of the letter. And I think any action, I think is how we phrased it. But anyway, that's my understanding is that's what we were trying to do. Whenever I receive any correspondence, I let them know that we've received it. It'll be on this agenda and thank them for the correspondence. So we okay. wouldn't receive that. So, but if we pass a motion in relation to it, like, are we now assume that we're informing people or do we need a motion to inform people? No. I, ought to, I think it's just an automatic, it's part of council follow-up to do that. Um, I don't think a motion is, so, is needed, but a motion we need to refer it. Okay, so can I move that uh, each member of the local committee receive a copy of the letter from Mr. Sopcer? Why not? Just refer him. Send it to the committee and let the committee sort it out. I would just like them to have it in a package or something that they can read it before the meeting. But the formal way to do it is like what they're saying is just refer it to the committee because it is a committee of council. We don't have to say it. Let's send everybody. Yeah. Okay. So is that your motion, Councilor Lonscroft? You second it. You've heard the motion to refer the document to the committee on the question. All in favor? Motion's carried. Thank you. Entirely because the package I have, I have a plea. I have a plea for us. Sequential, sequential yes. addressing of this letter will be very helpful for me. We don't jump back and forth. Just okay. The way my brain operates. So if we can tackle one and just move on. So you want to go through this item by item? If if if, if you're not doing anything, we can just identify okay. that for. Okay. Five point one, the Founders Society. Uh, I think the content of that letter has been. Understood. Widely okay. shared on a number of occasions. Um, five. Mm -hmm. then, will that be automatically referred then to the plan of home day process? I would think that would be appropriate, Councillor Carver. Not to, to refer to every letter. Well, we refer to committee. I would think we would. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a formal referral. I mean, like you said, everybody on the steering team knows oh. about it. The person who you know okay. put it together is on the steering team, but. If you want to formally refer it, then it should okay. be referred by item five point one. Um, I move that it be referred to the plan the home day process. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Wilson on the question. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, Sue Cunningham and Tate McDonald letter on supporting mm -hmm. the noise bylaw. Councillor so, Kim, Mayor, move that we receive and file item five point two and five point five. Five point two and five point five. Okay, seconders. Deputy Mayor seconds. Councillor Feeney's motion on the question. Oh, I'm a comment. Yes, please. Um, I'm wondering why we're not referring this to the Strategic Policy and Strategy Committee because the committee members are here. <laughs> and they're well aware. Well, 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 yeah. that, but that's a fair point, Councillor Carrad. Just felt it was a bit redundant, but that's. <laughs> Would you prefer to send it there? Because I strategy, you've only done it when it was for something that didn't line up with an agenda. Yeah, item. Yeah. Like we referred a letter to policy and strategy when it was a standalone 
letter warranting more discussions. But I don't think, I mean, not that you can't, but I don't think we've ever in the past, as Joe says, referred things to policy and strategy through this correspondence on something that's on the policy and strategy agenda because it was this year. But I'll live with it the way it is. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Motion's carried. Uh, let's go to Mahone Bay Tourism uh, and Chamber of Course, uh, Commerce's correspondence on the strategic plan. Um, can I ask about 5.6, the Honorable John Moore? Let's, well, I think that far yet. We, we're down at 5.3. Well, the Chamber's <laughs> 5. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 5.3. 
President uh, White House some time back. Councillor Kerr. So, so now that we voted to receive and file that letter, um, that, and it will also receive the standard your letter has been received. <laughs> it's been received and, and filed. And received, it's received and filed. And we're not going to say that the issue is moot at this point because it's not on the agenda anymore. I mean, I guess staff are not going to provide that as a little connective detail, but that doesn't mean we're not going to say it. It sounds like probably it's already been said. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are we talking about? 5.9? Just, just clarifying the reason the council is not writing a letter back about the oh, yeah. location yeah. is that we're not yeah. contemplating moving it at the current time. So that's, um, so we're not that's saying we're that. that. <laughs> that's most so I, I'm just experiencing some disconnect around the, the way we're trying to figure out how to handle correspondence. And for me, that to just say we'll receive and file that letter doesn't work very well because I think it does merit an answer. Um, and it's a hot topic. Hmm? It's a hot topic. It's 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 a yeah. hot topic right now. We've already well, decided like we, not to proceed for at least twelve months to do anything. No, no. When what twelve months? Well, I guess we're going to can come year. up again sometime in the future. But we haven't. Yeah, we haven't yeah. deferred. Some, we just yeah. put it said no. To yeah. The motion yeah. 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 some new yeah. information, perhaps. Anyway, the, Dude, it's always your prerogative, Councilor Carver, to make a motion that staff be directed to write a letter saying whatever council wants. So I think if you're feeling discomforted by the lack of more of a letter, then I think we should just get a motion to write one. I would like to make a motion that staff respond to Michael Brown's letter um, uh, explaining that there is no intention of moving the Senate at this, at this time. time. And <laughs> why not just end it as moot? Why not? Why why, why include the at this time? Why not just period? Because I, I don't I don't plan on revisiting this this term, and maybe that means never. I guess that's the thing is you know if if you say never, and then. Well, the future council decides to. You don't have to say no. You can't buy it. Don't want to leave that impression. What impression? That that well, it, it's not going to happen in the in the near future. So so yeah. the most well, it, it was a five to, it was a five to do vote. I mean, you it wasn't sure that it's off the table. I don't think the motion is a seconder. Yeah. So so, so it's it's the motion is incomplete. So we no. Okay. We need to. We need a seconder of the motion. Well, so second, Pastor yeah. Feeney, we're now on the question. And Any other question? And as it was phrased, it's, it's currently it's it was, at yeah. this time. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Motion is carried. All right. That's the end of correspondence. Yeah. Report. Staff, yeah. Oh, it's the end of the month. Staff yeah. report too. <laughs> No, so yeah. um, so happy to take any questions on this one. We did have, I think, a lot of uh, statistics section updates this time around, but I'm happy to take any questions on any part of it. Councillor Kerr. Um, I have a question about number five in the first section about the minimum standards uh, for housing being reflected in any housing strategy that Tally may develop. And I just wanted a refresher on where we stand with this. Um, I, I don't have a good sense of what this actually means, what we're actually committing ourselves to in that concept, and um, if and when, what, and what might be happening next on that. Uh, yeah, I can comment on that. So minimum standards, obviously, and, and you would know, but for the viewing public, it's you know, kind of a term, you know, a very remarkable term when it comes to housing. So basically, uh, the Municipal Government Act defines minimum standards as, uh, you know, rental uh, property standards is the ability of a municipality to set standards with respect to the condition of rental housing. And that would have to be done by bylaw and a number of municipalities have, I mean, they're mostly quite dated bylaws on minimum standards, mm -hmm. but um, in practice, their enforcement has always been 
Turkey uh, around the province. And uh, <clears throat> lack of minimum standards or lack of enforcement of minimum standards often leads to concerns about the quality of, like, especially the lower income housing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the intention here was that we will speak to the notion of Mahone Bay having or not having or in what form those, those minimum standards would take uh, in the development of the strategy. Uh, I can't say that we're directed to ensure that the eventual strategy will bring in to effect minimum standards and minimum standards enforcement because obviously that strategy has to be, you know, put through public process and be adopted by council. But when we discussed it and this motion was made back in um, 2021, the the idea was that we not uh, miss including minimum standards in the development of the, of the strategy. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Wilson. Um, I don't know the number if I had to write it down, but somewhere in here there's a note that says that the RCMP were issued ticket books, um, which I understand to be uh, for SOT for, summary offense ticket books for like parking yep. to to to, uh, to take care of some of our bylaws. Now, the reason I asked this question is because when we were discussing whether or not we needed a bylaw officer, I said, why can't the RCMP deal with this? And I was told at that time that the RCMP do not enforce our bylaws and will not. And I just like to understand which is true. So I wouldn't say it's a contradiction. I mean, I know these are grayer areas than people would like to work in, but I think the appropriate thing to say is the RCMP can enforce. Now that doesn't contradict the RCMP don't enforce. That's not a contradiction. I know it sounds like a contradiction, but um, no, I understand so, what you so, said. We we do encourage the RCMP to enforce <laughs> municipal bylaws. So, but the other part of what I was told we were told is that the RCMP have their own suite of noise regulations that they can enforce. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I'm gathering from what I'm hearing now is that the problem is they just won't enforce any of that stuff. Because they, <clears throat> I'm guessing because they don't want to get stuck in a bad situation. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, you know, they make decisions often. It's a resourcing decision why they respond to certain things. They have federal laws they can call upon, but if there's municipal laws in place, they can also call upon those. Provincial so legislation you know, as well, like the yeah, Motor Vehicle Act. Typically, those things are complementary. Like, you know, we're not in you know opposition to each other. We're just adding a little bit. So maybe the RCMP are responding to a call. There's a, a sort of smaller, more targeted offense in a municipal bylaw than the disturbance of the peace. And they might take that opportunity to lay that instead of, you know, because mm. the, the higher order might be more difficult to prosecute. So it's a, it's a tool they can add to their arsenal should they choose to use it, I guess is the best way to describe that. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think the CEO has said anything I thought <clears throat> a student is that if we have a noise violence, it's helpful to the RCMP because they can use it as and when it's appropriate, but they do have their own disturbance of the peace. And discretion over yeah, whether to respond to any calls. You know, like a, I'd be interested to get some kind of a piece in writing from the RCMP as to what they will and will not enforce. I mean, if they, if I don't want to call them to enforce a, an infraction of a bylaw, if they mm -hmm. absolutely are not going to, to do that. Mm -hmm. I think we should think about either refer to the PAB or um, the council should write to the RCMP for a definitive statement on that issue. Because I hear from different municipalities, <laughs> some people think that the RCMP do enforce bylaws. Other municipalities <laughs> say, oh no, they won't. And we seem to have differences of opinion around this statement. I think we should ask them the question and get a definitive answer. If we're going to do a noise bylaw and they're not going to enforce it, then we need to know that. So just as far as asking, I think there's two different, as you said, ways to ask. And I think you'll get a different answer depending on which of those two ways you choose. So at the PAB, the local detachment members can comment on their practice 
and then if we write to the regional level, they'll they'll write about the you know policy. There's not the reason there's I mean I, I don't want to no it's a national police force, but they do respond differently in different areas. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that is probably the regional variation you're talking about. At a certain level, they have that level of discretion and resourcing is wildly different. I know it's not supposed to be, but under the again getting getting really into it, but under the provincial provincial police services contract that we're under, the departments are randomly much better or worse resourced at various times based on their the movement to members and sometimes based on a rural area's ability to retain or not. Um, that leads to a very different resourcing level, a very different standard of then response. That should, that should be the answer that we get from the RCMP when we ask the question. And often it's the commanding officer, what, mm -hmm. what the goals are of the commanding officer mm -hmm. when they come, because we've seen that over a period of time and we frequently get a new commanding officer and they handle policing differently. Well, some are more community-based, some are not. If the law and the regulations that govern the RCMP allow for that, then I think we need to know that. It can't be up to the individual who gets posted here in, in, in our district and they decide to throw the book away, right? Because that, that also allows them to use a much thicker, heavier book if they choose to. Mayor, I mean, that's an interesting point. I think it might be wise for us later on uh, in the next two or three months to have a, dis a deep discussion on, on enforcement of bylaws and the town's expectations at one of our strategy and planning meetings and really <clears throat> like, spend some time talking about, you know, how many tickets have been written in the last three years, what, what's the nature of the tickets, Kind of generically, how many are parking, how many are noise, how many are unsightly premises, just so that council has a bit of a familiarity with, you know, where where the uh, where the effort is occurring and 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 what the seasonality is, and you know, I don't think we want the RCMP writing, uh, you know, walking up up and down the streets writing uh, writing too many tickets. Uh, if they've got other things that are higher priorities, but well, if you if you listen to the citizens who write or who buttonhole somebody on the street and talk about the noisy vehicles and the issues with parking on both sides of the street, and all the other, and then their next statement is, "Where are the RCMP in all of this? Why aren't the RCMP dealing with it?" And our answer needs to be more than well i guess they don't want to do that yeah. <clears throat> so obviously it's not an issue yeah. when was the last time there was a sit down with the rcmp in a in a discussion like could they come to the strategy we have a police advisory board that meets on a, on a regular basis yes and and issues like Parking, speeding, noisy cars, that sort of thing. Stats. It comes to that agenda quite often. The notion of vandalism and dealing with vandalism has been discussed at the PAB. Okay. That's not to say there can't be other opportunities taken, because obviously it's not working. Well, it's not working to the citizen's satisfaction. Yes, so... Uh... Hopefully it won't sound as if I'm trying to quash the sentiments, but I, I don't think it is a huge concern. Yeah, the, I don't think it's a huge concern about the RCMP enforcing or not enforcing bylaws. I think when I, when I think about their responsiveness, they've been responsive, and we've had conversations about that. that if there's another larger issue, maybe we need to have that uh, conversation. And the PAB is the rightful place to have it. If mm. these issues come up, then we have a structure in place that they actually we can have good conversations and, and we do yes so so uh, yeah not not to minimize it but for me i don't feel that that particular element of do they enforce or don't enforce bylaw is, is a big issue they, if we have a bylaw they will use it as a tool they, they have to have that discretion to figure out is this disturb disturbance have been called to in terms of priority how high is it or is it just a neighbor doesn't like their neighbor kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, what we can do on our side is ensure that we have 
enforcement capacity so that when the RCMP can't are not responding to a bylaw that we put in place, a bylaw officer can go and sort of assess actually is it mm. true? And that's that's our role to play, not the RCMP. So that's why because that's when that's how I, I think about it. Well, so you Yep. There used to be a once a year the commanding officer and whoever sat on the the police commission um, or whatever you called it used to have a, a public meeting usually at the fire hall. I I was one person who attended <coughs> many years. I was only person who attended, but there were some years when there would be a group of people there, mm -hmm. and it just gave an opportunity to get to know. The commanding officer and and some of the members would pop in. You know, whoever was on call would pop in, and and people could discuss and ask questions about uh, policing in the town. Okay. But that that happened. <clears throat> I went to many of those for years. I think last year, out of I just an interest to be efficient with the with the police um, staffs time we really refer all of those matters for the to the PAB um, and we used to have a double dip where they where they would meet with the PAB and then two weeks later they would have the exact same report to come to council and there was a general consensus at the time that it was a bit of there was a high degree of redundancy but I mean I do think it would be it might be worthwhile to invite um, to invite a uh, delegation or a presentation maybe once or twice a year so that the entire council has an opportunity to ask some questions that would be that would augment that that role that should, that's clearly at the PAB. Okay. You know, like at one time you you knew who your town council um, constable was when we when we started the community policing with the RCMP and that person made themselves known to citizens by doing foot patrols and Stopping at the school and we tend and, to have them in the summertime. I think now. Yeah, as but people to years people now. got to know them a little bit, and then, um, um, but that seems to have been lost in the last mm -hmm. number of years. So, and I think they, I think as a whole, the the RCMP have changed their their way of policing and less community based policing. Okay. Let's face it, they're not trained at the depot to do community policing. No, so they have a community, a person who is yeah, specifically yeah. assigned to mm -hmm. that. I know, but they're, you know, that's not part of their training at the depot. It's, but they can, very minimal. they do take training, like to be instructors for the deer, like the deer program was popular when my children were in school. It's and, gone. And that's gone now. But there, I think there's something that's going on now that, um, one of the members had mentioned that the meeting we just had that they're going into the schools and working with some groups. But they do have a school we had an officer who does mm -hmm. school liaison work. Yeah, I mean, uh, so evidence says the DEA program does as well. So they switched that, which mm -hmm. I think is a good thing. Uh, the school liaison officer is supposed to uh, develop rapport with students, and they do that. So their yeah, community policing has. Adopted to how things are. They do community policing, it's just different from what it used to be back in the day where you probably see them a lot in the streets. And and that those are the things that in terms of change we have to be comfortable with in, in, in realizing we live in one of the safest places around it. It's not because the RCMP are not doing their job, they're just doing it different. We, we don't see them, but they, they, they from my perspective, they're effective. Yeah, there's questions as, from my side as to how much we pay, and that's a story for another day. But I think in terms of the effectiveness of what they're doing, they've just switched uh, to, to methods that are more effective with the tools they have, because they don't have the manpower that they used to have back in the day, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think in this particular, and in many places, there's so many officers who are off on leave and things like that, and so they have to switch resources around to figure out where do you place the resources that you need. So I, I do. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so last thing I do agree, maybe that semi-annually or, or annual annual presentation to council may be helpful to just provide context. Mm -hmm. Councillor Kerr. No, Councillor Wilson was first. I just wanted to say that 
the community policing is also contingent on where they can get a good cup of coffee. So you'll find it <laughs> every weekday morning at the barn between 9 and 9.30. That's to come. <laughs> Councilor Carter. Well, uh, uh, there are so many issues here, but, but I totally support the deputy mayor's uh, idea that this conversation continue with the police advisory board. I also like the idea of inviting the, um, the staff sergeant or commanding officer who, who is ever re most relevant for our, our question and our needs to come and do a presentation here so we can have that discussion for 15 or 20 minutes sometime. And I'm also in, interested in Councillor Donis Croft's uh, concept of community meetings or, or having community meetings. And I began to visualize actually if council could host a series of public meetings, I don't know, once every couple of months. So <clears throat> one could be on policing, you know, lots of questions and answers. One could be on how does the town make up its budget? What's going on at the Silver Garden? I mean, there could be something every couple of months uh, related to a, a, a civic issue um, that might be of interest to mm. the citizens. Um, so um, I would like to <laughs> make a motion that we council do invite um, either the staff sergeant or commanding officer, whoever, the right title is um, to come and speak with us about um, bylaw enforcement, uh, relations with community relations, relations with the people in the community, community policing. With the dialogue. That's my motion. I'll second that. Are you talking about the invitation going to be at a council meeting or no. a special meeting where the public would be? encouraged to attend and participate. My thought was to do it at a council meeting. The, the other thought about a series of community okay. sessions was, uh, come back, we'll come back to that. We have a seconder? Councilor Lawrence Croft. Councilor Lawrence Croft seconds it. You heard the motion on the question. All in favor? Motion is carried. Okay. So let's continue with our staff reports. <laughs> Mayor item 40. Um, I um, I think we might want to edit that um, to align with kind of our more historical process where we simply um, speak to those types of items using the uh, street address of the customer. 40? Uh, that's item 40. That's item 40. The water. Credit yeah. Trinity United Credit, Church. Just like generically, the customer living at, you know, 437 oh, Main oh, Street, sure. you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. Is, as our as our normal practice, if we mm -hmm. if we're going to if we're going to exclude um, those types of things, we can just yeah slip you know, it. just yeah. getting a little lazy on our no no fair enough as a person yeah we yeah. would have but yeah yeah I just right I'm thinking ahead so I just yeah I think that's that's good practice to just use the street address is all I'm suggesting I think that's our general consensus from the yeah, whole the only reason we right? didn't is because it was an institution and we just yeah yeah, yeah fair enough. enough. Yeah. Councilor Carter, is it not important? Two forties. This is what I get tripped up on too. Okay. It's just that. Yeah. It's a, yeah. So I, I do have a question about in the uh, statistics about the uh, the speed readings on Main Street at fifty six kilometers per hour, mm. and on Edgewater at sixty kilometers an hour. Both up a fair bit. Yeah. What's yeah. going on? Is it just because it's summer? I bet. What? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, at PAB, we often dig in a little bit deeper because the stats mm -hmm. actually do, like, the full stats show outliers and time of day, and it, it, you can kind of get a sense of if there's something happening. Mm -hmm. I haven't dug into it that, that deeply at this mm -hmm. point, so I'm not sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Where was the sign on Edgewater? Right this is the permanent sign. Right at the bridge. Right at the bridge. Right at the bridge coming down the hill. Yeah, 60. <laughs> like one thing I noticed with that one is there's a lot of low speed below 30 that are kind of skewing it, which is yeah. people turning off of the yeah. two streets because they get picked up. So it actually like is worse than it looks if you're just going by the average in that sense. Um, but yeah, I think at, at PAB usually you have a chance to kind of delve into the stats. With, I mean, you can always forward the full, it's just a lot of technical information like what, what actually mm -hmm. comes out as a report so i only put this one little highlight here um but the pav package usually has the full 
It's like eight pages, I think. Yeah. So, Deputy Mayor. So for me, in many ways, this is not a surprise. It's expected. it's what? It's not a surprise. It's expected, and and that's the reason why we've asked continuously to move that sign, yeah. the fifty sign up. Uh, up the street, up the further. street further, because yeah, one forty. Oh, we tried everything. Yeah, exactly. So the, those speeds are, and I don't think they've changed much. They are both up by mm -hmm. I think four kilometers an hour from last month, which is, I mean, it could be seasonal. Yeah. We increased traffic. The, the tires going from winter to <laughs> summer because <laughs> there's more friction on the. Uh, and winter time, and yeah, and it will throw your it will throw your Rains. your your um uh control your speed control. I I would be willing to conjecture that people have gotten used to the fact that there's now a light a light signal crosswalk exactly in front of the restaurant. Yeah, and when they come around that corner at the top of the hill, they don't see any lights flash, and they just keep going. I think that's mm -hmm. right. I think that's right. Interesting. Whereas before, and you kind of had a little bit of trepidation because you thought you might kill somebody. Well, <laughs> yeah. For me, it's the number on the sign, yeah. right? Tells me to slow down. Anyway, yeah. the, uh, sorry. We'll sorry. continue to monitor. We we had this idea that we might just uh, move the sign <laughs> ourselves, and I was, I was wondering. <laughs> so what, yeah, it was yeah. a PAB conversation last time, yeah. but. Um, what Jonathan did was he did do what we discussed and he reached out to the local traffic uh, department <laughs> contact there and said, uh, we've got the signage all ready to go. If you just let us know it's okay, we'll put it up. You don't have to do a thing. Yeah. He hasn't gotten any response to that. Um, so that's what we would report back to PAB is we didn't get a response to that. And then I think the next thing is Jonathan's quite willing to just put it up. Yeah. But uh, you know, you know, we it's outside of our jurisdiction. This is fifty up the hill. Yeah, yeah and this is just putting a fifty up where the fifty yeah. ahead is, mm -hmm. and putting a fifty ahead up further towards the. Oh, so you start the fifty zone sooner. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Councilor, now. Yeah, just uh, referring to item forty-two. Uh, Good idea. Finally, the water drive the marina. The letter from the Wooden Boat Society pretty much nullified that and saying that all they were looking for was permission to put it in. They were willing to absorb the cost of it. Yes, I, I don't know if can, and that's if the council council feels that that covers what was discussed at the council meeting. I think there was a larger discussion about is it appropriate to have something in there, yeah, purely sure. to the benefit like of. Say, I know we don't discuss the financial cost of it because they were sitting there kind of they mm -hmm. back the cost. And that took all they're basically looking for is our permission to put it in there. So that's basically what we have to decide as far as I can say. Is, do it, is it appropriate to put it in there? So, I mean, this report is a different thing, though. I guess like, I don't disagree with you that that may be the, the main discussion, but this report was to consider the town having something in there that the public could use. And I think it was in opposition to the notion that only, even if the club pays for everything, or to the, the society, that only the members at the marina could use it. And if And if that's you know the distinction. The council could tell us not to do this report. Great, I won't. I won't do it. I'm happy not to. But I'm not. I just don't think that the report is immediately obviated by. I sort of got the that. impression from the letter that they would consider it letting the public in. I could be wrong on that. Well, maybe that's a follow up. We should look into that. Okay, that so was, maybe we can just clarify. If they're willing to pay for it and let the public use it, then I can assume that you know there would be some concerns. Mm -hmm. I think this. Okay. I think this is well covered um, now. Before we leave that item, I would note that while there are a number of gentlemen, uh, our ladies, who fish at the wharf and see themselves as proficient fisher persons, I don't know if that would constitute them identifying themselves as a fishing peer, <laughs> unlike what they're standing on, which is a PIER. Just to leave that. Yeah. Spell check won't catch that. <laughs> no, you're right. Uh, uh, and with that, I do that we accept the staff report for for the month of May. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Owens Croft seconds on the question. All in favor? Motions carried. Thank you, CAO, for that update. Uh, let's go to the staff report 6.1. Uh, that's done. 6.2 is the kindness meters. Councillor? Um, I would like to note that now Lumber County has been dissolved for a year and a half and 
if that meter is still up, it should probably be moved. So uh, yeah, jumping in. So now Lindbergh County is in the other properties list. So we just want to come up with a full list, but actually I, I don't think we ever consented to that one being installed. Now I would argue where they put them is on town property, but uh, our perspective was that they were installing them in their own parking area. So I guess Suttles and Seawinds would need to consider whether they'd like to change. But that. it's sort of false hmm. intentions. You know, someone may think, oh, this is a program. Who's getting the money. Yeah, like, that's a good, good question. <laughs> right? Like it, but I think it's a question it's for Suttles and Seawinds because we don't check the meters. No, We're not the right. problem. Okay. Somebody has a key to us. Yeah. So who, who does check? They each have a key that is given out to the association yeah. that is um, the funds are going to. So uh -huh. to, if now Lindbergh County had a key, either no one's checking it or somebody's still checking it, that, but I don't know. But it wouldn't really be our, I mean, either Suttles or now Lindbergh County would have to, we have nothing to do with them, that one. Okay. okay. But uh, I will just say, Mr. Mary, so the recommendation here is just to accept this report for information because it was requested by council for information, but if there's any other questions, I'm happy to take them. I don't know if everybody heard it, but I mentioned it to the CAO that the one at the uh, conversation on Edgewater Street was the Home Bay Lions Club, not Legion. Okay. And it's now going to be changed over to the Home Bay and District Fire Department. So, so, okay. And when you said that, right. obviously it was because the Lions were the ones who put in the seating area, and that's why it was. Because anybody knows the Lions, yeah. anybody know how um, financially advantageous they are to the organizations it's very good for the free churches yeah i've heard that the, mm -hmm. they, because i think it, it really does depend it depends on, on who it is. Is. And, and who it is but because the ones that the churches have are in parking lots which are free um okay. i do think a lot of people see it as like i was going to pay for parking yeah so i'll do that there the original motion was really driven by council's um concern with the lack of process around access to the town properties and obviously some town properties are very high traffic mm -hmm. and would be excellent sites for this type of fundraising and we just wanted to make sure that there was some kind of a fair process where various organizations could get access to the quote unquote prime real estate that was the original mm -hmm. so we started with we started with well let's just do a count and figure out what the inventory looks like yeah. on on town on town property um so i think this is this is excellent start and the next time that there's a request to put a meter on town property at least we have this baseline information and we can at some point we may have to uh rotate um the the sites yeah. so that various community groups can get access All to that to the, the you know to the high traffic town properties yeah. good point Anything else? Okay. Very good that we accept this report for, for information. Second. Seconded by Councillor Carver on the question. All in favor? Motion is accepted for information purposes. Let's go to Municipal Innovation Program application. I, Mr. Hyde. I don't, I don't mind skipping to that one, but there was one ahead of that one. The nursing home? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Did you want to go with a nursing home for Let's now? Let's do that first. That's important. Actually, it's, it is quite important. So this is another follow-up uh, to a specific direction of council. We had uh, a, a kickoff session, I guess, with Jim McLeod Group at the Mahomet Center, mm -hmm. and council wanted to ensure that we were supporting that welcome initiative yeah. and asked staff to look into that. Um, Kelly had an opportunity to work with their coordinator, and we see opportunities, I think, coming, but our recommendation is that we essentially let Tina inform us where the town support could be could be voiced and then with a reasonable small you know kind of budget as indicated there we can staff can just do that because um, mm -hmm. we don't have a, a perfect solution but also like if Tina comes and says it'd be really great if you guys could spend 100 bucks on something to help us out I mean do we have to come to council I guess you know we presume the intent of council was to be supportive <laughs> of this effort so our recommendation is to direct staff to support welcome initiatives for newcomers rather than from Kenya in coordination with the cloud group settlement coordinator. So do we have a manager budget for that? Analysis $500 would be in the, uh, we, we have room in the budget, so. Okay. Do we have any potential dates when? 
I don't know. I don't believe I mean, I you have so. heard all the stories about the difficulties of getting mm -hmm. the paperwork, the documentation. Yeah. Yeah. I'm missing in the summertime. And, you know, they come on a particular day. Tina suggested that they'll know more in a couple of months. So I think it's okay. going to be a little while yet. Okay. Um, should the $500 amount be included in the, the motion? The reason that it wasn't was just because that's like a, a ballpark estimate. Like we figure it will be within that amount, but it's not like a grant to McLeod Group mm -hmm. in the amount of $500. So that's why we didn't include it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if if we were requested to do something bigger than that, mm -hmm. we would we would come back and talk to council about it. So that's why it's not in, included. It is just mm -hmm. not. I don't think it's necessary. So there is a recommended motion. I'd like to move a save in the motion. Okay. The motion as it's written. Yes. Yep. Seconder. Well, council covered out the honor. <laughs> council <laughs> started. And that's okay. Now it's a very motion. motion. Moved and seconded on the question. All in favor? The motion is carried. Thank you. Yeah, I should have something else on the agenda so we can just skip over the next one. Just. <laughs> so now the municipal innovation program? Yes, the, the, the application process. So just a brief overview here. This was a follow up from um, Aaron Long area's general manager's presentation to the budget meeting on the 28th of April. And at the time, it didn't include quite as much specificity around the scope of the project that was being proposed and sources of funds, et cetera. Um, but he followed up with all that info and I put it here. Uh, I'm just going to add to what's presented here that uh, Aaron did inform uh, subsequently to this that Berwick has passed the motion approving, you know, essentially the same motion uh, that the same 50 and 17 as it says in there. And that uh, it's my understanding that the Riverport Electric Light Commission has also uh, in the amount that was specified in their case, which I think was 45. Yeah, 45. Uh, so, so that means that uh, in order to apply for this real innovation program, the only motion that Aaron is still looking for is, is ours, and that is as uh, as included here. Councilor um, Meaning and Deputy Mayor. Mayor, just to start, I, I move that Council approve the joint application to the Municipal Innovation Program and confirm that the town's commitment to provide fifty thousand dollars in cash, seventeen thousand five hundred dollars in kind contribution to support the project. Okay. Uh, second. You second it, and you've got a, on the question. Yes. Um, I, I, I don't remember whether we discussed this, but uh, what happened to Dan Ganesh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Aaron presented this as saying Anna Ganesh would kind of not, you know, not likely be a participant in this, and I think it was largely because um, this was driven by, you know, the the current opportunity, I guess, with Berwick having turnover at the management levels and acknowledging that they would like to work with us, you know, because we're close enough. Um, and and Riverport obviously have, being in a similar situation uh, and Annie Ganesh saying, you know, we're not right now we're focusing on, I know this, maybe they're not now, but, you know, they had some big stuff in the works up there in terms of the merger and um, mm -hmm. they just thought this wouldn't be something they could join in at this at this time was my understanding. I think Aaron put Annie Ganesh like with a question mark as in, They'll stay tuned and possibly join in the recommendations of this project if it if it benefits them to do so. Mm. Councilor Rolls Cross. Um, I don't know if this fits in, but the day he presented, the next morning I heard that there was a FOIA talk uh, with area and the Northern Pulp facility burning oh, the, the biomass. The biomass first. Yeah. So we had some conversation not in a meeting but a, just around it here about being surprised that he never mentioned that at all when he presented here so is that something we will be expected to contribute to as well or like do we know anything more about that uh, yeah we we did discuss go ahead so yeah i think we i think we should be considerate that this is an area matter and Aaron's statement on that was you know 
the board making a statement from area to the, to the media. Um, so that's why a statement was was made because the board was contacted. Aaron is the general manager. He is the spokesperson. He made a statement. Um, the board had discussed it and had given Aaron direction. We have members on the board and they may be able to fill you in you know, further, but I don't believe those board conversations were public. So that's why I'm being circumspect in terms of mm. what conversations had gone on at the board. Um, okay. so, so Aaron has commented publicly, I wouldn't want to step on the message there. That's that's the message from the area board. But internally, if we have questions about, you know, what did our members discuss as participants on the area board, I think that's something we can we can probably fill in, you know, privately. Okay. Um, I think that's probably all I could say. Okay, I see yeah. because you know they did list the towns that were included in that conversation in the, in this news um, briefing. So I was just curious if there was any more information coming out. Or I think Aaron said everything that we were prepared to say publicly at this time. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Carr. Um, given that we know that there are so many balls in the air. Um, in relation to area, I, I just wonder if, if staff or board members, area board members, can give some sense of um, level of confidence and the ability to, fall, to to complete this, to follow through in terms of staffing time. Um, and I notice that uh, Riverport is, is is in there with. The same kind of commitment that, as we have. Um, There's a is, is there, is there a, a level of shakiness about about this venture at all? Anybody? Uh, I can try. It's it's another one that's hard to comment on because obviously talking about yeah. other parties and you know we, we can't really go into detail about their situation. So um, what I what I can say is in terms of areas capacity. To take it on, and I, and I agree with you, areas they have been stretched quite thin. Um, I think the timing of this, you know, on Aaron's part, is intended to overlap the wind down of the solar work. Mm -hmm. So our project will be wrapped up before this grant is approved, if the grant is approved. So I think that's part of the timing in terms of resourcing. But this also does propose to bring on a new employee who would just run this project. Mm -hmm. So really, it's probably going to come down to getting a good person in that role. And Aaron, I think, has the capability to, to do that, to get the right person in the role. But yeah, so I think, but as far as the, everyone's made financial commitments, I guess, you know, if everyone's made those commitments, uh, we expect them to follow through on them. Uh, if we leverage the provincial money and one of the partners disappears, then I guess we still have the benefit of the provincial money if the rest of us are willing to, uh, you know, make, make good. Um, at that point, at least it's already been leveraged. Uh, I guess one additional detail, just because of the nature of the municipal innovation program, Berwick and Mahone Bay absolutely have to participate in order for this to proceed, because you have to have two municipalities to be eligible. Um, Riverport doesn't count. Mm -hmm. So their participation is not mandatory from the provincial perspective, mm -hmm. but the other two are. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> for that tricky. And we may not get the funds anyway. Yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to the and it's a follow on to the U the NS uh, the UARB rate hearings where they directed at the end of the hearings that the information will develop through this process. They are expecting the an answer. Certainly the next time we go for a rate increase is well, we asked you to, or did you investigate, or have you looked at all the opportunities that are out there? And just as a follow on before they leave that, you would ask at a previous meeting about the minutes of the area meetings. Um, the minutes, of course, have to be approved at the, uh, the next meeting before they would be released, and that's coming up in early July. The June meetings were postponed, I think. Yeah, we're looking, yeah, we're looking for a date. But as soon as the minutes are approved, then the members of the board will have it, and I will share those with the council. <laughs> okay? 
Mayor, just one final question on this item, which, you know, 14 cents on the dollar, I think this is a wise, wise investment. Our, our funding is coming from town general versus the utility. This is an investment where we're making in collaboration with, with our partners in area, but it's not specifically an eligible cost for the utility. It is an eligible cost for the utility, ah, okay. uh, particularly because as the mayor was saying, what we're doing is we're basically leveraging the requirements of the board mm -hmm. to do a little bit more exploration in an interest that the board has encouraged, certainly. I mean, some things they've required, other things they've encouraged. Mm -hmm. um, so it is an eligible cost, is my understanding. Uh, you know, we obviously still have the choice about doing that. It doesn't have to be a utility <laughs> expense. <laughs> Robbing Peter to but, pay uh, Paul. You know, we had <laughs> 30000 in there uh -huh. um, with the intention for that to be a utility expense. Okay. And so talking about making it 50 now, I guess my thought will be in the budget presented to you for next week that it will remain a utility expense. And then if we want to discuss what that, you know, bottom line looks like, well, that's the appropriate meeting to, to do okay. that. Fair enough. So right now it's planning to be budgeted as a, a utility yeah, expense. Yeah, as a draft budget. Okay. Okay. Anything else? All right. Oh, oh, well, that was a question on the motion. I just tried <laughs> to say we, we need to add the motion. Yeah, to the <laughs> okay. On the motion, the question, all in favor, motions carried. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, let's go to committee application 7.1. That is an application from Helga Baxter for the Asset Management Committee. Somebody wants to make a motion to appoint her. I'll make the motion. Councilor, Councilor now seconds. You've heard the motion. On to question. All in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. Now let's go to the um, next item is the NS, the UARB electric rate decision. Uh, and as, as council is aware, on the uh, 28th of April, the UARB approved our request for increased electrical rates. The board approved a total of 30.6% to be implemented over a two year period. Beginning with the electric bills that will come out due the end of June, they'll see uh, consumers will see a 20% increase in the rates for all customer classes in their utility bills. And then in, a, in a January of 2024, which is the beginning of the second year of the process, they will go up a further 10.6%. And because we didn't get the 20% increase levied on the bills until June, we've been buying electricity at a higher cost than we were able to charge our customers. So the town is going to have to look after that shortfall uh, by using uh, reserves. And then over a five year period, the cost of that will be recovered. The town will pay back the utility for the money that it's going to borrow. <laughs> okay, so that eases the transition that the 30%, uh, it should have started in January. It's not going to start in June. So the town's going to borrow from the utility uh, to sort it out. Uh, we continue to develop our alternate sources of electricity. The wind farm, of course, gives us 40% uh, of our energy needs. And then beginning this fall, when the solar garden comes online, we will have an additional 16 to 18% of our electrical requirements provided. And even that is going to be less expensive than wind power because we're not paying the transition, the transmission fee. The, the, wind, the wind power we have to pay to get the electricity here. We pay Nova Scotia Power's transmission fee. We're not going to pay that 
with the solar garden electricity because it's right here in the town. I see them working up on uh, on Pine Grove today. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there will be uh, a press release uh, coming out. Uh, would, wouldn't wouldn't be out before. It'll be out what Tuesday you expected in the. Yeah, well, we'll provide it to the media tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. If anyone okay. Comes, they work them. Yeah. Okay. And you can uh, the, for the folks at home, they can go uh, to the town of Mahone Bay .ca, That's our website, and there'll be more information concerning the UARB's decision. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I think that's it for that. Any questions? Okay, let's go to hmm. that. That let's go to committee reports. Senior safety program. Um, I move that we accept the report. It's okay. Written. You have copies of the report in your package. Anyone has any questions or? Seconded, Councillor Wilson. So on the, so the question for the motion. All in favor? Motion's carried, thank you. Let's go to the community <laughs> steering team's draft minutes of May the 8th. I'll move that we approve the and accept the minutes. And okay, okay. Seconded by Councillor now on the question. All in favor? Just, just a, Deputy Mayor. Uh, a clarification uh, uh, on the, there, there's a motion that was moved that talked about use of hatchways for the development of a possible town building. And I was wondering what that was, what is. Um, <clears throat> it's a program where um, you put in what you were looking for. So we put in different images of, of the, the three churches and some photos and previous logos that we've had and some information about the town um, and then different graphic artists go and they try and create their vision of, of what it all means to them and then they will feed it to us and we can choose ones that we it's a very interesting concept quite a few of the people in the room, use that themselves when they're doing branding and, and uh, logos themselves. So we should be getting some. Did any come in? Uh, a lot have come in. Mo mostly, you know, the ones that come in right away are very minimal effort, I guess you could say. Um, but will the, the official competition closes tomorrow? So the committee, when they meet on Monday, will have everything. Well, we'll send it. We'll send it tomorrow. Closes. I think Saturday morning. If anything comes in late, we'll send that as well. But um, yeah, there's definitely dozens of submissions. I just we'll see if any of them are. And then you can go back and say, well, we would like um, certain colors on our logo, or we would like to get a, a more sense of uh, a certain feel for our, our town. And, and you can keep going back once you, you pick back, the purse. Yeah, you go back to the graphic artist yeah. and you say, we'd like to see a little bit more of this or more of that try to pinpoint as to what you might like more on it, and they will change it. And then at the end of the process, whichever one you choose to go by, that graphic artist will finish up the final product, and that's where they will get paid. Otherwise, they don't get paid anything up to this point. So Hatchwise is basically a, a, a service that provides these things out and provides an opportunity for people to bid in on them, and then you go from there. Councillor Carver and then Deputy Mayor. Um, could uh, the chair of the committee refresh my memory about the process after the committee has sort of narrowed down its options. Um, is it going to come back to council for a decision or is the committee making a decision? Well, where is the decision making happening? Well, we would like to put it out as a, a to the public um, to choose um, their, their favorites. The, the, the final decision would come from council, but um, we would like to put it out in a survey form, um, the top ones that were picked by the committee, and put them out to the public to see if the the what the public prefers. And we may come back with 
two or three to council. We're not sure how many we will. I mean, if there's an overwhelming for one particular one, we may just come back with one, but our intention is to allow the public and whether that will be in a meeting and, and on like online and whatnot, we haven't confirmed that, but we will be consulting with the public with their preference. Mm -hmm. well, I'm sorry. Yes, so um, am I right in thinking that the, the final decision is going to be for the town corporate logo? And that's going to be used then on town stationary town vehicles. Um, will it be used at the entrance to the town that now has I, the old three church? I so, don't think that's our decision to make as, as the committee. That's up to the town to committee how they they will use the logo other than on communications, I would say. Um, I, why would you change what's already... Well, that's Ready. part of the decision. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Mayor, let's, and then we'll go to the CAO. So I think we've already made those decisions. I was just asking for a refresher. Yeah. That, a refresher. Uh, that's, it's a bit frustrating when we go back to our decisions all the time. When we've made that decision a few times, we've clarified for the committee, we give the committee the opportunity to come up with a logo and decide. They will come to council with the logo and tell us this is a community logo. We've already had that discussion many different times, so let's let's respect that process. I think it's it's helpful for us to to give the committee that opportunity to do what they need to do without questioning what they're doing. So they're so asking they'll make the recommendations to council. To council yeah, yeah. With, with the final yeah. law. May I just remind council that I was asking for a refresher of um, yes, to where you. we stand. Thank you. So, so the, the message I get when we, we ask those questions is that we're questioning our own our own decision making process all the time, which makes it very difficult for the community <laughs> to actually understand whether we we've made decisions about that. What what I wanted to ask was um, as a process, I remember what we talked about, and maybe this has changed a little bit. Was there supposed to be an RFP, and 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 maybe this is something. You, we, we this, this is not a matter so I was wondering. Maybe the AAL can speak to that. Okay. Let him finish this. All right. Yeah, you, okay. yeah, yeah. You, you want to respond to this to this curious, question? Yeah, I can I certainly can. And Suzanne, feel free to jump in. Uh, so, you know, just take it back one slight step there in terms of Suzanne having come on the committee, obviously, after a lot of those discussions. So yes. it is good that we kind of have a little bit of a refresher on it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what they were charged with by council is to do whatever is necessary to come to a recommendation that the committee would say to council, our recommendation is this logo will become the new logo for the community. It will be used at a minimum by the town as our corporate logo, but it is also going to be available for wider use, including when there is a refreshment of the highway signage, for example, um, it could be incorporated there. So specifically to the question about how we get there and is there an RFP involved? Um, so the committee was given a budget to go to RFP and, and hire <coughs> consultants. The first thing that they discussed when they got together was, do we go straight to a consultant who leads a public process or do we want to dip our feet as a committee into a public dialogue because none of the members of the committee other than Richard had actually been party to any of our previous discussion. Uh, they wanted to get out and, and do the survey, which they did. Yeah. And that gave them, you know, what they felt was the design criteria. I think everybody would say, we know what the design criteria ought to be. And it was proposed that the, the quickest, cheapest, most actionable way to get out there and see if anyone could do that design based on that criteria was to use the service as opposed to the go to traditional RFP. Um, I don't think we've ruled out going to the traditional IRP. I think we'll see what we get for a very minimal effort through Hatchwise. Yes. And the committee is probably at our meeting on Monday going to be discussing, is there potential in any of this or do we go and do a more traditional IRP with the budget that we have and the time that we have? <laughs> yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah. And, and the, the members of the committee are very conscientious that money has already been spent on a logo um, Taxpayers really shouldn't have to be burdened with more. Like uh, we we can spend up to the twenty five thousand, but members are quite happy to go as economically as possible uh, in in thinking about the taxpayers. So that that is a concern of the group, and many of them 
we're very, you know, like just get back the old logo and be done. <laughs> but um, we respected that there were other opinions around it too. Just to add to that, I think we spent a hundred dollars on the hash. Yeah, a hundred dollars. Yeah. Two hundred. But a lot of us have palm trees. Palm tree. Leave that for money. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a large international thing. Yeah. <laughs> there can be all that's happening. So living in the Christmas tree capital <laughs> of the world. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess my my last question would be around in terms of expectations. Uh, what sort sort of timelines are you thinking about? We are hoping that by September, we will be back. It could be back sooner than September, um, but I doubt it, but we are hoping September, early October, that we will have a new goal. And so in thinking about that, I don't know how much heat or not heat there will be around the global conversation. <laughs> and, and thinking about Plan Mahone Bay as a process, I wonder at some point whether we might need to have a conversation as to how we stagger the, the heated debates in the community. It's, it's, it's a point for us to think about. <laughs> to think about because I, I know there will be a, some element of, um, it, it's already started a little bit, some element of uh, people being uncomfortable to change it in the uh, plan the home process. And so that can create a, a little bit of heat by itself. Mm -hmm. I hope the town level will create any that this well, that's what we're hoping by doing a public <clears throat> public consultation and feedback yeah. that people have the opportunity to to voice their their concerns and and, and their views and and also to be a part of the process. Yeah. Would, would, would that be something we start to want to think about and sort of give us some advice as to? Yeah, I guess you know it. It kind of. When we talk about our next meeting, the process from here will probably have a better sense of timeline. Like if we think we can work with something from Hatchwise, it may be an opportunity to get, and again, I don't know what the committee's preference will be, but like to get into consultation with the community before summer, mm -hmm. in which case I'd say probably that's good to go ahead and get it out of the way <laughs> in a sense. Yeah. Um, but if we're going to end up going to an RP, what we'd end up doing is we'd probably select an artist by the end of like July and then somebody would they'd have to work through then we'd end up into September when we actually were looking at designs in the community so I think probably when we know whether which what we're doing as far as that goes yeah. that will inform whether it's going to need to be discussed in terms of timing and maybe um Suzanne would bring you know that back to council and say you know that the committee's ready but we understand there's some timing this council want the committee to take you know, three months off here before going to that final engagement, which I mean, I'm sure it's a council's discretion. But we should have a feel when we do uh, a vote uh, on the chosen logos, we'll have a good feel of what the people <coughs> feel in the town. Okay. Thank you. Good discussion. Let's go to Heritage Advisory Committee, the draft minutes of May the 10th. Uh, this interesting, con interesting conversation of the HAC, that was the day before, I think, council meeting before town council. So you don't want to be redundant and re uh, rehash some of the earlier conversation. <laughs> but um, the one takeaway is really around this uh, issue around the insurance industry mm -hmm. and their underwriting decisions across all of Atlantic Canada, specifically on houses built before 1945 and, and, uh, and older. And at the time, this would have been the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th of May, um, there were a number of members of the community who had received letters from their insurance underwriters saying that they would no longer be providing them services. Um, and that those services are going to, were going to uh, be withheld like a week later. So there was uh, quite a few. There were there were two um, specific instances where uh, folks really felt um, disenfranchised from their requirement for uh, for insurance. Through that, those discussions somehow was conflated with the uh, municipal heritage designation process. 
and whether homes that um, that participate in the in that program um, could receive insurance. Um, the good news is that it's kind of a it's an ongoing story, but through uh, Kelly's support and direct intervention, um, the homeowners were able to resolve their issues. Um, but the takeaway is really a follow up conversation with the province and Kevin Barry has been invited to speak to us sometime in the next couple months. Us being uh, us, HAC. HAC yeah. and, and through HAC to the council, really around, around understanding uh, if there are any impacts and if there are, how we can mitigate them. But more importantly, there's going to be a conversation about what, where would the town come down in the case of a very unlikely, never going to happen, but what if it happened situation where you did have uh, a designated property that has a catastrophic fire, for example, burnt to the ground, and would the town avail of the full powers of the legislation for a rebuild? And what would how did how how would that decision be made? And what would be our what would be the thinking around the table? Because it absolutely would impact the underlying insurability and the view of of the insurance payout from the underwriters. So. We had that conversation it was an uneducated opinions. We just, it wasn't a well-informed conversation, but it was interesting and it may, it may lead itself to a, a, a policy clarification that will be required by council at, at a future date when all the subject matter experts have a chance to come in and, and inform council and staff about the moving parts. But um, you can imagine um, an underwriter being told that they are required to, because there's this plaque on the building, you're required to completely rebuild the entire building as uh, back to its original 1880s facts, for example, versus the underlying intention of the program to be, to maintain the street facing facade with its character defining uh, elements. Um, so those are parallel, those are far, those, the, the, those, uh, that desire is far apart, uh, you know, we, and we've had a catastrophic fire in Lunenburg with a, a church burning down. And what we, we saw there is what I would expect we'd see here. We'd see helicopters with politicians flying down with checks from all over Canada uh, and large endowments coming to the, to the ride and to the rescue as well, as, as that did occur in Lunenburg. Um, but, but that's a very different home than what council would do based on the authority that's that's available to council through the legislation. Anyway, um, so that was an interesting conversation. Um, nothing resolved and no opinions set and everybody's open-minded, but I do think it's something that we're gonna have to, um, I think this issue of around insurance for older historic homes or older homes is going to, is going to be an issue. And we just need to kind of get our ducks in a row mm -hmm. sometime in the next year about, um, about how we would approach that. We did have um, the two other items, 4 point, uh, 8.4 and 8.5. And again, thank you very much, Kelly, for shepherding us through the process. We have um, 496 uh, Main Street, across the street, and 45 School Street. That's the, uh, the old school. And I think, Kelly, if I'm not mistaken, when we're ready, we're ready to, we're ready to uh, officially uh, move that the property at 496 Main Street be registered as municipal heritage property. Someone will second that. Thank you. Will be seconded. Thank you. On the question. All in favor? The motion is carried. And Mayor as well. Uh, I'd move that um, the property at 45 School Street be registered as a municipal heritage property. Seconded by Councillor now. On the question. This is the old school building? Yeah. Yes. I thought that had been done before, but just mm -hmm. never gotten plaqued. This I, is officially, officially, it officially is. registered. Okay. <laughs> I did it 10, <laughs> well, more than 10 years ago when I was on the board, I, Penny interviewed me <laughs> on behalf of the, <laughs> the... Don't worry, Suzanne, we're not blaming you for the decade <laughs> that the paperwork didn't get filed. It wasn't your fault. <laughs> okay. On the question, <laughs> all in favor? That motion is carried. Thank you. Thanks. Could I just ask a question on the insurance thing? So was that insurance known? They wanted to cancel it because of the plaque. Was it 
Not just because no, I mean there was a number of there was a number of, there was commentary in the community, um, right. but uh, after uh, Ke Kelly had um, communicated kind of the the start the 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 attributes of the program, it was resolved to okay. everyone's satisfaction. Yeah. Okay, so it looks like otherwise any building older than that wouldn't be insurable. Well, one hundred later, cancel insurance for all homes yeah. Yeah. over a certain age. In so town. when they were looking for other insurers, then the questions came up about yeah. how yeah. Yeah. the workmanship that was involved in the church in Lunenburg would make it unbelievably expensive <laughs> to duplicate. But if you're in a you know a big box house with square windows and Nothing particularly mm -hmm. architecturally unique. It shouldn't cost any more mm -hmm. to replace it as a result of a fire than whether it's registered or not. I think the takeaway for council tonight is that a major Canadian insurance company withdrew from the Lunenburg okay. County market and it affected a number of homeowners in the town. Yeah. And they've been fortunately they found alternative providers, but we may have to do a little more to make sure that this problem doesn't extend expand. Okay. Is that, is that worth going to the Department of Community Culture and Heritage They're, and having a conversation with them? Kelly's uh, already reached out and invited Kevin Barrett to come down and oh, he'll okay. be coming down and meeting with anybody who wants to attend on the course later on this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think it, it would be wise to invite the um, Trustees of the of the three churches, um, because mm -hmm. um, I know that in in if the United Church was to burn down, we would never rebuild the way we may put a front on that looks similar, but we we know we would never we're not insured enough for what the building is worth it cost for, for one thing, but we know with a with a Decreasing congregation and decreasing funds, we're not going to build something that is unattainable and unsustainable. Mm. I mean, um, and I don't know what the other churches, I've heard com similar conversations around other churches, uh, the Anglican church is controlled <laughs> by the diocese, but um, it, it just doesn't make sense in this day and age to invest that kind of money. The big building, like yeah. That when we're doing the upkeep and everything so unless you know the province stepped in or something and said well we will pay that it, okay. it just doesn't but i the public works building it looks like a church is that what you're proposing yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 it would be public yeah. someday. okay uh that concludes <laughs> our agenda what is oh, oh the open water shed advisor my god Pour me a drink. I would really accept those from it. Thank you. Okay. Seconded by Councillor Owens Croft on the question. All in favor? Thank you. Now we will conclude our agenda. Oh, okay. just a, I just have, oh, oh you're going to do a notice of motion. Yeah, I'd just like to give notice of motion that um, at our next regular meeting, I will bring a motion. Uh, requesting council to send a letter to the province um, asking for um, attention to the signage, uh, the, the messy signage at exit 10. Um, this was uh, raised and brought to our attention by the chamber when we met with them. And it's been, the issue has been around for many years. <laughs> Anyway, that's my notice of motion. Okay. Thank you. My highway through. All right. Uh, does anyone? How many folks do we have watching? Uh, eight. Eight. Does anyone have a question? There is one. Um, please further explain parking proposals under land use bylaws, specifically whether parking spaces off Main Street are included in minimum parking spaces required. I'll read it again. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it'll make it easier to answer. I'll, I'll answer it either way, but I'm not, I may move to address the question. So please further explain parking proposals under land use bylaws, 
specifically whether parking spaces off Main Street are included in minimum parking spaces required. It's a question to council, and now that the public input session is part of the agenda. Oh, we should, I mean, did it discuss uh, oh, again, we we did during the, uh, uh, during the yeah. meeting. So. <laughs> I guess that's a new thing. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I don't, I, all I can say is that the parking requirements in the bylaw are requirements on a piece of private property based on the use of that property. So um, the bylaw would, would, as a basic level, apply to every property in town and provide requirements for parking based on the use. And that's the same as our current bylaw. I think the big distinction here that's that's maybe some people have raised and maybe it's been um there's been some misinformation around is the proposed draft means to eliminate existing parking requirements in certain cases for a section of Main Street on the water side of the street where the existing buildings and the footprint of those properties and available land make it impossible to comply with any uh, current parking requirements with respect to change of use. And that is limited to a very specific area. And if anyone is more interested in learning more about that, thankfully the Plan Mahone Bay website has all the drafts and, uh, and even fact sheets that highlight this particular thing. So if you go on there and look at the fact sheets or look at the draft documents, you can see the map and which areas are proposed for that parking exemption. Um, but, but in general, even to leave aside that exemption, every property has parking requirements under the new and existing and any land use bylaw. So hopefully that just so, so questions. Am I correct in, in, in understanding that businesses on Main Street, this side of, you know, above Town Hall, they don't have that exemption or on the other side of the street businesses don't have that exemption so the, it, it, the proposed area because it is being proposed, proposed area is a small area yes you're correct it, it is proposed to include correct. only essentially from the intersection of main and edgewater down towards the marina properties on the water side yeah. which simply are constrained by the size of the lots and the footprint of the existing buildings yeah. in terms of their ability to add any additional part. But it isn't, can, can not any business be constrained by the size of the lot that they have? I, as theoretically, yes. Yeah. You know, even, even Walmart can only have so many parking spaces. Um, but as a, as a matter of fact, you'd have to demolish any of the buildings on the water side of Main Street to change their use from what they currently are to any other type of commercial use in order to comply with the parking requirements. So that's what's oh, being approached through this. I'm not, not, I'm not, now, people may disagree with that, and that's what the public process is for. I'm not disagreeing <laughs> with the, <laughs> oh, the exemption for that part of Main yeah. Street. I'm disagreeing yeah. with the fact that there doesn't appear to be any exemption for anywhere else on Main Street that can be confronted with the same problem. Well, we've had 30 well, meetings on the topic, yeah, and there'll yeah. be more office, more opportunities beyond yeah, today. I mean, there, there is a material difference between mm -hmm. a piece of property that chooses to use their, their total plot in a certain way and a piece of property with an existing building that any change of use would require the demolition of that building in order to make space oh, available. That's, so that's, it, people may think that that's not a good enough reason and they can challenge the exemption and that's what the public okay. is for. Um, but there is a, a material distinction between that's why that area was proposed. So, so does that mean that there'll be parking on both sides of the street in that area? No, it has only, no. so just in case, in case anyone is confused, and I think people are, yes, the bylaw has nothing to do with availability of public parking. Yeah. The, the land use bylaw regulates the requirement for a private business owner to provide parking for their business. And if you have an existing business, the existing parking is already what you're required to provide because it exists. But if you were to start a new business or change an existing business to a different type of business, there are new requirements that would apply. And then that would be the case today. And that would also be the case under the new bylaw. The only distinction that's being proposed as a possible way to encourage development in the downtown is that we would not apply those new requirements to changes of use in a particular area because it would be physically impossible for anyone to meet them. So, so that's what's being proposed. And people may disagree with that. 
obviously that's the purpose of the process is to hear that. Yeah. But I, I, I do feel like every time we get a chance to correct the record as to what is actually being discussed, it's important to do that. And then if people disagree with that, great, we'll hear from them and the steering team will, will obviously make a decision. Um, I, I think it's been disappointing to hear that people seem to be concerned that it would apply in some cases and not others, not necessarily because it shouldn't apply in the cases that are being advanced. And so I, I would be disappointed, I guess, if our conversation gets turned around so that we're defending the need to do something rather than discussing the possibility of doing more. Uh, but that's for the public yeah. conversation. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Mayor? No, so I just wanted to say is that, that as, as Joe pointed out, is that we've had yeah. <laughs> lots of conversations about that as a steering mm -hmm. team, and I think we need to have confidence in the documents we've sent out there. There will be feedback like this, which we'll consider, but in many ways, that is an equity issue that we've seen. With, in fact, we had a, an email about a possible business that we, we were deemed to have denied, which we did not know, that mm -hmm. possibly this particular change would, would, would help with that kind, kind of stuff. And so there's, uh, it's equitable to make that change, I think, from my perspective, because those properties are in a unique particular constraint. And so I, if we as councillors can have confidence in the documents you sent out there, then it, it is yeah. in, in terms of how we, we take in the comments that come in. Because yes, it's a concern. If, if yeah. we have confidence in the documents. In the documents we've sent out. <laughs> I think we spent quite quite a lot of time and money and energy in producing them. And I think, at least on my part, I'm confident we did do a good job thinking about those different scenarios and how they would be impactful. Really? Yeah. Mm, okay. All right. Uh, any other questions? No. No? Okay. Um, well, the agenda being yeah. completed, the meeting is now. We, we, have, yeah, closed we, session. we have a closed session. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, I've married, but we moved to closed session. All right. Do we have a seconder? Bonus Croft was first. All in favor? Motion is carried. We'll go in camera. We'll let the folks on YouTube. Um, Back to the park again. Have it go back to their home.